Well, good morning, everybody. My breakfast chat today was, how terrified am I? <laughs> because being here, because even though I've been teaching at the university for 30 years, see, and I used to joke a lot, I was trying to translate my jokes into South African English, and I couldn't. So you, you got to be patient with me. My name is Adolfo Navarro. I am a professor at the University of the National University of Mexico. I live in Mexico City, and it's my first time ever in Africa. So, what the hell I'm doing here? <laughs> Jesus Christ. So that, that is all town's fault. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's funny to, to be here because what I want to do now with you is like present you a series of steps and a series of points of view and how we can analyze and present data on biodiversity, especially on species riches, richness and endemism into different scales for different publics. And especially like giving an example how we in Mexico pe performed our, our increase of knowledge of biodiversity using one, one, one taxon as an example that is? Birds. Birds. Why? because ornithology is the mother of all sciences. I will lay an egg, of course, on your head. Okay. So what I have prepared is like in several parts. The first part is very basic, like it's directed to a general public, and we will go deeper and deeper into science until we get this, this, this set of steps that I hope are useful for you to develop the communication and the analysis of your data for your own countries. I, I beg you some patience, especially for some, in, in some instances, your countries and your data sets are far beyond what I'm present here. But for others, no. So I'll try to make a, a mix and think that Everybody will take some advantage and, and will like what I'm presenting. And we'll, we'll have a set of examples that you can work in the afternoon to develop an example like, like the one I'm presented. My English is fading right now, but I'm, I'm trying to do my best. Okay? Be patient, please. Biodiversity is a word that we use very, very likely, very, very often. And its definition is as complex as we can. We can use a very simple definition, like diversity of life. We can have definitions of, that in, involve more, more information or more complex. But it is a word that everybody in our countries knows, from little kids to the, to the scientists. So it is important for us to take an account that we have the responsibility of using our data and our information and our knowledge as scientists to communicate information to different kinds of publics. We are, we are, we are in a point that we ha have the responsibility to present information to general public and to generate information into scientific publications that are peer reviewed and all that, that you know in, in this world of, of scientific meaning. In some instances, science is like art. We are producing knowledge that has to be shared. If, you, if we are painters and we will keep our paintings in our house with nobody seeing them, it is, it's, it's a, a useless work what we are performing. And it's, it's the same with the, the information by diversity information. How we communicate biodiversity patterns to, into different levels. First, we want to know that the people that know about the, the issue have divided biodiversity in three different levels that has to deal with the scales, with the scales at which the processes that affect the patterns of biodiversity are acting. We have a very uh, a starting level that we call genetic diversity that deals with the 
variation of the species within themselves. That's the diversity of genes, and this is just an illustration. I presented this for a, for a group of high school guys. They liked a lot the, the example on the dogs. It's perfect for genetic biodiversity. The second level deals with processes that affect species, the units of evolution, the units of biodiversity. So we have this taxonomic diversity that is, that is defined as the study of the diversity of species on the planet. This is a very important, a very important part of the study of biodiversity because it's the one that we manage and we talk about more, more lightly and more, more often. African cats, right? Some of them. The third level of diversity is called ecological diversity. And this has to, that, that approach deals with the interaction of species among them and with the environment. So th this, these three levels are very easy to understand are very easy to visualize, but what we have to visualize also is that these levels are not closed boxes. When we study diversity, we move among these different levels of these different le levels and different scales because processes, that is the most important thing here. What processes are acting to produce the patterns of ecological diversity? Uh, and sometimes are different than the ones that are producing the diversity of species, but sometimes are the same. Uh, and we're looking at patterns that, that result of the interaction of those processes. So it's, it's in, like in any area of biology. See? Nothing is clear cut. Everything is a continuum that we have to deal with that. The reason we have these levels of analysis of biological diversity is because the processes are different. And we have to, to think, when, when we see uh, a pattern of the species richness, we have to think that there are several uh, issues, several processes and several uh, attributes of the, of the world that are ca causing those biodiversity levels. And, and we have to look for the right one. The, the, sorry. <laughs> for, for the right ones to explain the patterns we are observing. For example, here we have these global patterns. Are all of these are affecting the way we are detecting biodiversity patterns right now. Nothing to explain. We, we have seasons because of the earth, Earth's angle of, of rotation. We, we, have, we have differences in humidity and precipitation because of the ocean currents. And we have differences in the, distrib in the geographic distributions of species and, ma and major taxa because Earth has suffered major changes along its geologic history, like the, the continental drift. Well, one good news is you're not listening to town. Bad news is because you will hear a lot about, Met about Mexico. Some of you don't even know where it is. <laughs> All of you don't care where it is and what it is. But, but think that is, this, my example is in a, regi in a region in Mars or wherever. It's, it's just a region. When we have a large country to the north, this is Mexico, we have a set of small countries to the south. But what is important to, to, uh, to point out in this slide is that besides these large scale geological and astronomical attributes of, of the land, we have topographic diversity as shaping biological diversity. And wh why is important to, to say, is this a pointer too? Oh yes. What makes a country the, the, with high topographical diversity, we have my beautiful country that I miss a lot. It's big mountain chains running along the north to south, 
high plateaus, coastal lowlands, yes, peninsulas, another, another set of, of mountains. And this gives a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of topographic complexity that it's, it's also one of the causes of the observed biodiversity patterns. However, um, I, one of the main points of my talks today will be this. We cannot forget that our data, our point data, our niche models, whatever, represent units that are product of evolution. Biological diver diversity is a product of evolution. That is modification, inheri inheri modification inherited, inherited, inherited modifications. And without looking at evolution, we will not be able to understand the real, the real heart of biological diversity. And this part of the slide just represents that also Darwin thinks that ornithology is the mother of all sciences. Why do we have biological, the, 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 fir the first, one of the first patterns that arises when we describe the patterns of biological diversity is how distribution of animals and plants are, is restricted to certain areas of the world. The distributions are, the distributions are non-random. And most of the, most, in most instances, we have species or higher level taxa restricted to certain areas of the world. And this is a very old pattern. This is essentially the first pattern that was described for biological diversity. That is, the geographic realms that were made by a couple of, of guys. Do you know who? Who did this classification? It's everybody a biologist? Just, just, just a question. We have, no, it's, no, 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 because sometimes we have computer guys and so everybody's a biologist. or kind of. Yeah. <laughs> Those were made by Wallace and by an ornithologist, Philip Sclater, both British. And what, what do we see? They, they constructed this classification based on the distribution of families and orders of, of mammals and birds. And we have that major taxa of these two groups of vertebrates are restricted to these areas that are separated one from another by some kind of barrier. Sometimes are large barriers, very evident barriers, but sometimes not so, not so clear. So, what is happening in a region like in, like in Mexico is that if we compare the barriers that are separating the Palearctic from the Oriental region, what is separating this? Hmm? What, what mountains? The Himalayas. It's 8,000 meters of rock. So that's a huge barrier. What is separating the Theopic from the Palearctic? Millions of square miles of desert, of uh, rock forest, right? But there's nothing separating, clearly separating the Nearctic from the Neotropical region. So what we have here is a transitional zone. Once a Pan the, Panama, the Panama Bridge uplifted, uh, several millions ago, faunas and floras that were evolving in isolation here in the North American area and in South American area came into contact. And we have this movement of faunas and floras along the, along the bridge. Some, some, some groups were able to succeed and go far like the wild cats. Others were able only to get to the tropical areas of Mexico. But essentially what we have it's a transitional zone. So let, let's add, we have complex topography, we have 
the, the big, re big ge geographic regions, we have a transitional zone. And due to the complex topography, we also have places in which populations of animals and plants get isolated. And through time, they evolve and differentiate into different taxa. This is called in situ evolution. That means that we have a combination for, 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 for this area that we call Mexico, we have a combination of factors that are producing a large amount or a or certain amount of species with different evolutionary origins. The ones that come from the south, the ones that come from the north, the ones that have lived here for, for a long time, and the ones that have differentiated in situ, in the sites. So, we're adding. So are you following me, the, the, what, what, I'm trying, what I'm trying to point out? So this is mer mercadotecnia. What's the word for mercadotecnia? Marketing. Marketing. <laughs> okay, we, we have this, com this complexity of origins of our biota. We have this complexity of biological diversity. Another way to, to point out how, how important is the diversity in any region is to compare the number of species, the species richness contained in that area against the, the, rest, the rest of the species of the taxa in the world. And this is a figure that you can easily produce from your own data. How, what's the number of species, what's the percentage of the species of certain taxon that is present in a region? Okay, for example, for Mexico, of course, for mammals. L look, look at the, at the raw numbers from 4,000 and something the species of mammals. We have about 11, 12 percent. For birds, in, in, with certain point of view, we have more or less 9,000 species, we have 1,100 species of birds, that is 13% or so. For reptiles, we have a total in the world of 6,500 more or less. We have 750. See the numbers for plants. So wh wh what I wanna see is more or less the proportion of the species richness in Mexico in different taxa is almost similar in, 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 each, in each taxon. And this is the, the figure for fungi. The thing is, do you think our region that we have defined is 12% of the emerged land of the world? So is there a perfect relationships be, between the percentage of the, of the area with the percentage of species that we are founding in the area? It is not. It is not. So here comes marketing again. <laughs> that makes Mexico one of the mega diversity or the mega diverse regions of the world. This is this is a classification that we use a lot, especially countries that, we, that are <laughs> belong to this exclusive club that was designed by this set of divas. See, the biodiversity divas that get together and decide, okay, who wants to be biodiverse? Yeah. <laughs> who wants to be mega diverse? Okay, show me the number of species you have. So, so this is a very exclusive club. But it, it, it is real. It is real. The, the patterns are, are, the, are, are in general consistent with the species, species richness of a country. Mega diverse means that altogether these countries hold 70% of world's biodiversity. Wow. One of the points that we want to stress when we are talking about uh, the diversity of our countries, of our regions, is that what is the amount of species or taxa that, that, that what? 
It's another complication that I have to be here in front of the camera. I hate this. I, uh, Jesse was telling me the other day that Kenyans know very well Mexico because of the soap operas, the telenovelas. That, <laughs> so that embarrasses me a lot. <laughs> That's why I don't want to be in the camera. <laughs>